Good morning and uh, welcome to uh, the service. Uh, really a wonderful gift to be able to enter into worship on the Sabbath day. And so uh, welcome all uh, members of Bryanston Methodist. Uh, for those of you who are visiting, uh, good for you to be here. And uh, may God's blessing be upon you. Uh, because it's the first Sunday of the month, uh, we will be uh, entering into communion, as is our practice. And so uh, for those who have uh, fetched communion elements, um, if you could make sure that they are ready uh, for the service a little later on. I want to uh, share with you a, a call to worship from 1 Corinthians 1, um, verses 3 to 7. All praise to the God and Father of our Master Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all comfort, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is also going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God is there for us. We have plenty of hard times that come from following the Messiah, but no more so than the good times of his healing comfort. We get a full measure of that too. When we suffer for Jesus, it works out for your healing and salvation. If we are treated well, given a helping hand and encouraging word, that also works to your benefit, spurring you on, facing forward, and flinching. Your hard times are also our hard times. When we see that you're just as willing to endure the hard times as to enjoy the good times, well, then we know that you're going to make it. No doubt about that. So I want to light this candle, and we light this uh, candle as a symbol of God's presence with us and as a declaration uh, that God is a present with us at all times, uh, in the hard times, um, in the times which work to our benefit, um, and that his healing comfort is always offered uh, to us. We pray together. Father, we just want to acknowledge you as the Almighty, as the Holy, uh, as a good Father. We thank you that uh, you continue to gift us in so many ways. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of salvation. Uh, we thank you for the gift uh, of growth, of being able to mature uh, into the people that you mean us to be. Uh, we thank you for the people that you put alongside us in our journey through life in order for us to uh, learn the lessons that we need to learn in our full maturing. But Father, for your goodness, for your love, for your mercy, for your healing, for your restoration, for your forgiveness, for your provision. We want to give thanks today especially. We present ourselves to you just as we are, uh, just in the situation that we're in, and we just acknowledge that uh, some of us is okay, uh, but there are parts of us that are battling but we bring our, all of ourselves to you. And Father, we ask that you will be with us, that you will minister into the depths of our being, uh, that your spirit may continue to do its work to uh, sow the seed, to nurture the seed, uh, to reap a harvest that is for your glory. And so we just make ourselves available for your spirit to move deep within us and to do your work of establishing a wonderful kingdom, a kingdom that uh, is different to the kingdom of this world, a kingdom that is superior to the kingdom of this world. 
a kingdom that operates differently to the kingdoms of this world. And so, Father, will uh, your kingdom come uh, right here on earth, just as it is in heaven. Bless us in this time, we pray. Amen. We join together in a song of worship. What? Bible reading is taken from uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 14, uh, reading from verse uh, 15 to 24, uh, one of the uh, parables of Jesus, and I'm sure you will uh, know it well. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. 
Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet. He had invited many guests. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said that I've uh, bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I've just got married and so I'm not able to come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. The owner of the house became angry. He ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done. Yet still there's more room. So the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste at my banquet. The Lord will always bless by the hearing of his word. This is a moment of uh, worship where we uh, offer our gifts, uh, that which we have uh, thought in offering as symbols of our gratitude, um, symbols of God's provision uh, of all his good gifts to each one of us. Uh, to Bryanston Methodist um, and uh, for us to pray a blessing on uh, every hand that gives uh, and to ask God uh, to use that which is given uh, for the sake and for the benefit of uh, the people of this community. And so we enter into this time of offering. Father, we uh, just acknowledge that you uh, are a God who calls us to cooperate with you, uh, to cooperate with you in mission, uh, to cooperate with you in uh, just giving flesh, uh, giving uh, some kind of uh, example of what uh, being a child of God is all about. And so, Father, we... Uh, bring ourselves to you and we ask that you will continue uh, to use us as we offer ourselves as a church, as we offer ourselves as that example of uh, being a kingdom people, a royal priesthood, uh, people who uh, find their place uh, uh, with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so, Father, will you take these gifts that we bring to you now Will you bless them? Will you use them for your kingdom purpose? Uh, may they touch people's lives. May they transform and bring life. We thank you for uh, the invitation uh, to each one of us to be partners uh, of your kingdom sharing. Amen. Three descriptions of mature people. Firstly, mature people have developed relationships which free them to share their thoughts, tell of their judgments and values, expose their fears and frustrations, admit their failures and shames, share their triumphs. 
because they're sure of who they are and who they can become. They're free to honestly share what they feel and love, what they honor and esteem, what they hate and despise. Free to share what they hope for, what they believe in, what they are committed to. What is inside of them is revealed to the world through these things. They're free to be what they really are and say what they really think and tell what they really feel and express what they really love. A second description. Mature people are not only open to themselves within, but also to their environment. They are in a deep and meaningful contact with the world outside of them. They not only listen to themselves, but also to the voices of their world. The breadth of their own individual experiences is infinitely multiplied through a sensitive empathy with others. They suffer with the suffering, they rejoice with the joyful. They are born again in every springtime. They feel the impact of the great mysteries of life of birth, of growth, of love, of suffering, of death. Their hearts skip along the, with the young lovers and they know something of the exhilaration that is in those young who are in love. They also know the ghetto's philosophy of despair, the loneliness of suffering without relief. The bell never tolls without tolling in some strange way for them. A final a description of a mature person. Mature people have explored themselves and have experienced the various parts and powers of themselves. They are aware of the vitality of their senses, emotions, minds and wills. They are neither strangers to nor afraid of the activities of their bodies and emotions. Their senses bring them both beauty and pain, and they refuse neither. They are capable of the whole gamut of human emotions, from grief to tenderness. Their minds are alive and searching, their wills reach out for an ever greater possession of all that is good, and at the same time, savor all that is already in their possession. They have listened to themselves, they know that nothing that they hear is evil or frightening. They display a radical self-acceptance. They are not only aware of their physical, their psychological and spiritual hungers and activities, but they accept these as good. They are at home with their bodies. They accept their tender as well as their hostile emotions. They are realistic about their limitations. They do not always understand fully, but they do accept fully their impulses, their thoughts, and desires. They hunger after life in all its fullness. Thus, not only are they at home with what they have already experienced in themselves, but are also open to new sensations, to new and even deeper emotional reactions, to changing thoughts and desires. They say an expansive yes to life and an amen to love. They accept the inner condition as forever changing. They are ready to examine their belief systems, ready for vision therapy and anything else that promises growth. For them to stop changing is to stop growing, and to stop growing is to stop living. Their ultimate destiny as human beings, that is what they will become at the end of life, is delightfully unknown. They do not dwell in dreams of what they want to be and spend the rest of their life convincing themselves that they are these things. They have no ambition to turn out like anyone else. They are just themselves, their potential selves, newly actualized every day by new experience, is constantly being explored. They trust their own ability to cope with all the challenges that life will present. I'm not aware of any person consistently living up to the standards of maturity that are mentioned in these three descriptions. It causes me to consider what stops you, what stops me from being able to say 
that we are maturity in flesh and blood. Hasn't it got to do with the fact that we have been broken, that we've been knocked down, that we've been wounded through particular experiences that have come to us in our past, which rob us of this destiny as fully matured persons? The truth about life is that not all of life's experiences are joyful and creative and upbuilding. That many of our experiences are in fact destructive experiences. Actions that we have done, actions that have been uh, done to us, that have in some way continued uh, to break us down. Experiences of childhood abuse, uh, parental neglect, neglect, relationship betrayal, unemployment, failed work experiences, life-threatening illnesses, divorce, family breakups through constant conflict or distance, uh, losing a loved one, uh, becoming uh, a, uh, being subjected to crime uh, or injustice. These experiences render us as broken people. And so in the words of Jeremiah, the clay pot that was being shaped in the master's hand uh, is marred by these things. And it's not uncommon for such experiences to take people to places of crisis, uh, to places of deep despair, to places of conflict where people battle to live life well, where people battle uh, with their faith in God. And it is these uh, negative, these difficult experiences that cause unformulated but radical decisions to take control of our own lives. After these kind of things happen, we are driven by how do we make sure that this never happens again. We're in crisis. And in that state, we make the decisions which seem to us to be done for our own interest. And so we go about solving our own problems, being the masters of our own ships of life. But the fact of the matter is that by ourselves, we can only be consumed by our problems and expose ourselves to suffering shipwreck. It seems to us that we're making decisions which are protecting ourselves but they are in fact decisions which diminish the circle of our horizons and our worlds become no bigger than our problems and our hurts. We have reacted to the problems and hurts that have been, we've been subjected to and that begins to define our lives. And so in our attempts to numb the pain and cope with life, we turn to some false comforts which mask the pain but over time we realize that they bring little or no healing. And these false comforts are like little shields which we carry in front of us as we enter into the battle of life. They are designed to protect us from being hurt further. I think some of those false comforts include compulsive behaviors, uh, addictions, uh, to uh, drugs, to alcohol, to compulsive busyness, uh, sometimes to taking on self-sufficient attitudes uh, or being a people pleaser uh, or the like. But these false comforts become manipulative. They set up others to react to us in a way that we want them to react to us. And so, for example, we settle for being children uh, for being inadequate, for always being in need. We send out uh, pity signals in the sounds of our voices and in the expressions on our faces, in our childlike behavior. We condition others to react gently to us. Others of us will assume some kind of messianic role, insist on wanting to save uh, all people at all times. We will want to be the helper to make everybody else to whom we relate as the helped. These false comforts 
cause problems. Problems that are immeasurably more destructive than whatever pain we are seeking to escape from in the first place. And as a result, over time, we realize that we're not getting better. We are actually feeling worse. We enter into times of feeling dead inside, even though we are still alive physically. Uh, Robert Frost, uh, the American poet, uh, once advised, uh, never build a wall until you know what you're walling in and what you're walling out. And the deepest sadness of living behind walls of false comfort is that we cut ourselves off from all genuine and authentic contact with the real world and with human life, which is able to bring about our potential maturity and fulfillment. Too often in our own attempts to bring comfort for our suffering, we wall in our pain. We wall in our anxiety, our guilt, our feelings of inferiority. Too often in our attempts to bring comfort for our suffering, we wall out a true and deep love of self, a genuine and a joyful self-acceptance, an authentic self-esteem which results in an interior sense of celebration. It's good to be me. I'm happy to be me. We cease to be authentic. And as persons, we begin to starve ourselves to death. We wall out any possibility of human growth and we reduce our capacity to live. Self-knowledge is always defeated. We are simply not being ourselves and so we cannot emerge as we should in an atmosphere of growth. We're merely performing on a stage. And when the curtain drops after our performance, we will remain the same immature people that we were when the curtain went up at the beginning of the act. While life may seem safe behind the walls of these false comforts, it really is a lonely life. We cease to be authentic. And as people, we starve. We wall out any possibility of relational growth. We reduce our capacity to love others. And all possibility of honest self-communication with others is impeded. Little chance is left for true interpersonal encounters to be experienced, which alone can put one on a path to human growth and the fullness of human life. Thus the perpetual child never relates well to others except when bringing problems or helplessness to them. The self-styled saviour never relates well to others unless the other is in trouble and helpless and needy. In short, our formulated decisions to live life behind false comfort, comforts leads us to live a life of disconnectedness. Lives that are disconnected from God, lives disconnected from others, lives even disconnected or fragmented within ourselves. They are decisions of turning away from love. In this time of a global difficulty and challenge, can I invite you to take stock of your life? If you really want to see things for what they are and tell reality like it is, you require to ask some uh, very, very revealing questions. What you and I really need is a moment of truth and a habit of truth with ourselves. We need to take time to ask ourselves questions in the quiet personal privacy of our own minds and hearts. Uh, just take time to reflect in the presence of ourselves, in the presence of God, and ask ourselves, what parts of my life am I trying to hide? What games do I play with other people? What is it that I hope to win in these engagements? 
what parts of my life are being lived behind some false comfort, what part of my life can I not disclose to the world in celebration? And my willingness to be honest with myself to these questions will be a decisive factor and the essential condition for a movement towards growth as a person, for my moving towards full maturity. Now, I find tremendous wisdom, direction, and strength in uh, Jesus' parable about the banquet meal, which we read earlier. For me, it captures much of the comfort that is offered to me in my immaturity and in all the causes of my immaturity. And so in this parable, like uh, parables, uh, well, like is the nature of parables, Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God. And in this case, he says it's being, uh, the kingdom of God is like a joyful and festive dinner for which invitations are sent out. And just imagine the invitation that is sent out from him. To read something like this, that you are loved, that you are accepted, uh, that you are forgiven, that I want you as my guest. And so I've prepared a banquet, and the banquet is now ready. Come and share in the feast. RSVP, Jesus of Nazareth. Note also where the invitation is directed. First to the very, very public places. And then it gets directed to the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame that are found in the streets and lanes of the town. And then it gets directed to the remote rural areas. Now the host spoken of in this parable is the very host that presides over a similar banquet at the deep center of our beings. Jesus invites everything that is public about you to come to the feast that he is offering. But this is not where the invitation stops. The host at the center of your being asks you and me to search out the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame aspects of our own being. He invites those places that are broken and says, bring them to the banqueting chamber. He then orders us to take his invitation to the most, uh, most remote parts of our being. No part of you is excluded from the table of banquets. All of you is invited to this homecoming. And here the living Christ is waiting with open, open arms to wine and to dine with you to transform you into the new person that he has been patiently forming. And through the power of his crucified love, Christ can bring healing for the wounded child within. Through the power of Christ's crucified love, a betrayed heart can be strengthened to give itself away again. Through the power of a crucif uh, crucified love, confidence in the conquest of death can be restored. This resurrection power of God's love, it cancels the power of our brokenness to pronounce a final and a definitive word over our lives. This is the work of the God of all comfort. Paul once brought himself to the banqueting table and placed himself, placed all of himself in the presence of the divine host. And he records the comfort that he received in this act in the following words. God's grace is sufficient for me, for the power of God is made perfect in my weakness, and therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, 
in insult, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulty. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so the host is awaiting. The host awaits. He is the God of all comfort. And his invitation is for you to bring all of yourself uh, to him. May all of who you are begin that migration. And may all of who we are arrive at the banqueting table where we meet the great host of love. Amen. Uh, the teller of this uh, parable as well as the uh, host at the banquet uh, gave us a, a wonderful tradition uh, that we here at Bryanston observe uh, every month. And that's uh, to uh, just have a foretaste of the heavenly banquet that we have been invited to. Uh, it's captured in the event of the Last Supper that he shares with his disciples. It's captured in the uh, Eucharist uh, that is performed in churches. And so I invite you, if you have some consecrated elements, to uh, grab those and uh, have them ready, and I'll lead you in a time uh, of communion. We praise you, Lord God, King of the universe, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. Uh, he gave thanks. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So Christ has died and Christ has risen and Christ will come again. And therefore, Father, as he has commanded us, we do this in remembrance of him. We ask that you will accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Father, will you grant by the power of your Holy Spirit that we who receive your gifts of bread and of wine may share in the body and in the blood of Christ. Make us one body with him and accept us as we offer ourselves to be a living sacrifice. Bring us with all of your creation to your heavenly kingdom. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so it's through him and in him and with him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is given to you, Almighty Father, from all who dwell on earth and in heaven throughout the ages. And so, Lord, we come to your table trusting in your mercy, not in any goodness of our own. We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table, but it is your nature always to have mercy, and on that we depend. And so will you feed us now with the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, that we may forever live in him and he in us. Amen. And so we draw near in faith in this time, and we receive uh, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is broken for us, uh, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for us. We feed on him in our hearts with thanksgiving uh, and by faith. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ. the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank you, Lord, that you fed us in the sacrament, united us with Christ, 
and given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet prepared for all of humankind. Amen. We continue our worship in song. Wonderful to uh, be able to meet with you, to share God's word, uh, just to reflect on it a little bit and really trust uh, that God's spirit has ministered to you uh, in this time. Uh, let's say the benediction together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, be with me until we meet again. Amen. <laughs>